oceans have indeed been out of sight, out of mind, and it's nice to have an opportunity for them to be front and center. I hope this is just the beginning. My name is Jane Lubchenco. I'm Wayne and Gladys Valley Professor of Marine Biology at Oregon State University. And as you mentioned, I had the pleasure of serving on the Pew Oceans Commission and now on the Joint Ocean Commission Initiative. I'm here today as a marine scientist to describe some of the impacts of climate change on oceans and some of the implications that that has for us. Uh, I respectfully request that my PowerPoint images, which I will use, and a white paper on oceans and climate from the Joint Ocean Commission Initiative be entered into the record. Without objection, it will be included. Thank you very much. Um, I intend to uh, focus my remarks both on impacts and on implications today. Uh, and with respect to impacts, uh, I want to talk about two different categories of impacts. One are those that have been predicted and in fact are happening. Uh, that includes warmer oceans. Sea level temperatures are rising around the world in every single ocean basin. Sea level is rising. And as Dr. Kleypas will describe, oceans are becoming increasingly acidic. And that has huge consequences for much of life in oceans and in turn for us. I also wish, though, to focus on some surprises that are playing out that we suspect uh, are related to climate change. Uh, and they really underscore how little we really understand about how the oceans work and how they will change in future as these other predicted changes uh, come about. The, uh, there is no doubt that ocean temperatures are increasing and that sea level is becoming more acidic and ocean uh, levels are rising. It's worth noting that all of these are happening faster than originally predicted. Uh, warming and acidification are particularly serious threats to marine life and to the benefits provided by ocean ecosystems. Rising sea level is a very real problem for many people, in, especially in coastal communities, and for coastal habitats. But by and large, uh, on balance, the warming temperatures and increasing acidity are far greater threats for most of life in the oceans. Turning now to consideration of some of the surprises that we are seeing in oceans, I draw your attention to the western sides of most of the continents in the world uh, that are characterized by what are called coastal upwelling ecosystems. These ecosystems are particularly rich. They represent only 1% of the surface area of the oceans, but they have historically provided 20% of our global fisheries. Many of these systems are changing dramatically, and I'd like to describe some of the ways uh, that we are documenting. The systems uh, depend on winds that blow along the coast toward the equator. This, in turn, pushes surface waters away from the coast and brings up cold, nutrient-rich water, which is why these systems are so incredibly productive. Off the Pacific Northwest coasts, off Oregon and Washington, we have a seasonal upwelling that appears in the summertime. Uh, it's intermittent, so it's upwelling, alternating with downwelling. And our uh, rich systems uh, are legendary. What we are seeing is a very significant perturbation of this normal upwelling, uh, specifically the appearance of new dead zones. Now, these are different from the dead zones that you have heard of in the Gulf of Mexico and elsewhere around the world that are driven by runoff of nutrients from the land. This is a different type of dead zone. It is caused by changes in the coastal winds and in ocean conditions, both of which we believe are likely related to climate change. We've seen a dead zone off the Pacific Northwest coast now six years in a row. Uh, 2006 was the longest lasting. It was four months long. It uh, occupied as much as two-thirds of the water column. This is a slice of the ocean uh, where you see in colors different amounts of dissolved oxygen. On the far right of the screen is uh, the land, and uh, the bottom shows uh, the coastal, the continental shelf getting deeper and deeper. Uh, and as much as two-thirds of the water column, the blues in here, are in fact uh, too low in oxygen for most marine life to persist, and so they suffocate. This image shows uh, where the dead zone is in blues and purples is the dead zone off the coast of Washington, Oregon in 2006. And you can see it's a very significant fraction of that shoreline. 
um, our research teams have, in fact, been working hard to figure out what is happening and why. Uh, we've pieced together a story that suggests that changes in the coastal winds and uh, ocean conditions are the culprits here. There has not been a change in the runoff of land, so it's a different type of dead zone, but changes in ocean conditions and wind conditions are well described. We have images from remotely operated vehicles that have been driven along the seafloor showing uh, what the seafloor looked like in normal years, for example, in 2000, uh, and then uh, the devastation that has happened since then in 2002 and also 2006, the images that you see on the screen with just massive numbers of dead crabs, dead sea stars, dead urchins uh, on the ocean floor. I had a, a movie to show you, uh, but I'm not going to have time. I want to switch quickly to uh, the implications of this. Ocean ecosystems are already at serious risk. Many of the services that they provide to people are being threatened by overfishing, destructive fishing gear, a runoff of nutrients, chemical pollution, and coastal development. Um, the things that people want from oceans uh, are, in fact, at risk. And if society wishes to avoid the most serious consequences that climate change is already bringing and that will get worse, uh, we need to do a number of things. Reduce greenhouse gas emissions very significantly, first and foremost. Secondly, avoid mitigation quote unquote solutions that trigger serious unintended consequences. Third, as you mentioned, prepare to adapt to changes. But I believe we need to expand the way we think about adaptation. And it's not just adaptation of human systems, but in fact, we need to think about creating the conditions for nature to be able to adapt to the inevitable warmer waters and more acidic waters. If we have more funding for scientific research and monitoring, we can do a better job of helping to figure all of this out. And of course, educating citizens is incredibly important. Um, <coughs> strategies to minimize impacts of climate change uh, are both to reduce stresses that can be controlled and to protect as much biodiversity as possible. So in summary, Mr. Chairman, uh, oceans are in very serious trouble. Climate change will exacerbate them. We understand them relatively poorly. We need to reduce emissions. We need to make protecting ocean ecosystems one of the highest priorities. Redefine adaptation to include creating the conditions for nature to adapt, increase funding, and educate citizens. Thank you very much.